tell God all of my troubles when I get home. Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, When and Where I Enter, Anna Julia Cooper. On the 23rd of March, 1925, in Paris, France, a Martinican student by the name of Jane Nardal attended a dissertation defense at the prestigious Sorbonne. The event left an indelible mark on Nardal, who was then 23 years old. She wrote of its impact a few years later in a letter to Alain Locke, the African-American professional philosopher best known as the premier theorist of the cultural movement we now refer to as the Harlem Renaissance. In her letter to Locke, Nadal writes of going to congratulate the impressive scholar who had just defended her doctoral dissertation, a 66-year-old black woman from the United States whose thesis explored attitudes toward slavery during the time of the French and Haitian revolutions. Reflecting on the effect that this experience had on her burgeoning racial consciousness, Nadal explains that, my curiosity, my interest, already captured by other things Negro, began to awaken. We will return to Nadal, and of course, also to Alain Locke, in future episodes of this series. Our concern at present is with this remarkable older woman who took an unapproved leave of absence from her job as a high school teacher in Washington, D.C., to go to France and become the first black woman to earn a PhD from the Sorbonne. Nadal identifies her in the letter to Locke as Mrs. J.J. J. Cooper, but clearly misheard or incorrectly remembered the first initial, for her name was Anna Julia Cooper. She lived a very long and intellectually productive life. Well before her achievement in Paris, she sealed her place in the annals of Africana thought with her 1892 book, A Voice from the South, which is now widely acknowledged as one of the philosophical masterpieces of black writing in the 19th century. Cooper was born into slavery as Annie Hayward in 1858 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Her mother was an enslaved black woman, and it's generally assumed that her father was her mother's master. At the age of nine, just a couple of years after the end of slavery, she began studying at St. Augustine Normal School, which would eventually become St. Augustine's University, a black college. Her studies there would stretch over 14 years, and she served as a tutor and teacher for the school. It is also at St. Augustine's that she met George Cooper, whom she married in 1877. Unfortunately, he died after just two years of marriage. This is tragic, of course, but it is natural to wonder how different Cooper's career might have been if her husband had lived. As in the case of Maria Stewart, whom we discussed in episode 44, being widowed arguably allowed Cooper to forge a path as a public intellectual. She earned a bachelor's and then a master's degree in mathematics from Oberlin College in Ohio and eventually ended up in Washington, D.C., which is where she lived most of her life from the late 1880s all the way until her death at the age of 105 in 1964. For much of this time, she taught at the M Street High School, later renamed after the poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and for some of the early years of the 20th century, she was the school's principal. It was during the early years of her time as a teacher that Cooper gave us a voice from the South, its uniqueness is evident from the book's preface, entitled Our Raison d'être. Here, Cooper uses both musical and legal analogies to explain the significance of her intervention. Within the silent South, as the white writer George Washington Cable had critically called the region, there is what Cooper calls the muffled strain, a jarring chord and a vague and uncomprehended cadenza that is the Negro. But then, furthermore, she writes of that muffled chord the one mute and voiceless note has been the sadly expectant black woman. This description of the black woman as a voiceless note can be connected to Cooper's choice to label the first of the book's two parts, which is the part that focuses most on women in general and on black women in particular, soprano obligato. The voice from the South heard in this book is the voice of a black woman, bringing a long ignored yet indispensable contribution to the mix of voices speaking out on America's present and future. Switching to the metaphor of a courtroom, in which attorneys on opposite sides dispute the colored man's inheritance, while barely paying attention to what this black client has to say, Cooper writes, One important witness has not yet been heard from. The summing up of the evidence deposed and the charge to the jury have been made 
but no word from the black woman. After describing the black woman yet again as open-eyed but hitherto voiceless, Cooper makes a key point that demonstrates why this book has been so cherished by subsequent generations of black feminists. Ending the black woman's muteness is necessary, she tells us, because as our Caucasian barristers are not to blame, if they cannot quite put themselves in the dark man's place, neither should the dark man be wholly expected fully and adequately to reproduce the exact voice of the black woman. In other words, the black woman is not merely part of a genderless black collective that can be represented sufficiently well in the voices of black male authors, neither can the white woman stand in and speak up for her. The black woman's experience is unique, which is why it is necessary to listen to her. The first chapter of A Voice from the South is called Womanhood, a Vital Element in the Regeneration and Progress of a Race. The earliest of Cooper's major writings, it was initially delivered as an address to a gathering of black Episcopalian clergy in 1886. One especially noteworthy and much quoted sentence from this chapter is considered to be among the most insightful statements of black feminism ever articulated. We'll leave you in suspense for a bit and lay out the context of the remark before quoting it. The chapter begins with an extended reflection on the relationship between social progress and the treatment of women. Taking a breathtakingly broad perspective, Cooper pursues this topic through a comparative global history spanning millennia. Yet this starting point is also troubling, as she posits a divide between East and West that homogenizes the East in order to criticize it and glorify the West. She subsumes cultures from China to Turkey under her sweeping judgment that, in Oriental countries, woman has been uniformly devoted to a life of ignorance, infamy, and complete stagnation. The general stasis that results in the East is, she thinks, in sharp contrast with the progressive, elevating, and inspiring character of what she calls the European bud and the American flower of modern civilization. Cooper's metaphor seems to suggest that America is the culmination of all the world's progress and thus beyond reproach. Culmination it may be, but America is far from perfect in her view. To the contrary, she is careful to note that our satisfaction in American institutions rests not on the fruition we now enjoy, but springs rather from the possibilities and promise that are inherent in the system, though as yet perhaps far in the future. What is it that makes America special anyway? Cooper argues that European civilization has reached its greatest point thus far in American life because a high regard for women was built into two of its sources, namely Christianity and feudalism. A tender regard for women among the Germanic barbarians informed the value of chivalry that was central to feudalism, a value that magnified and elevated the position of women. You might wonder if appreciating feudalism in this way means ignoring or condoning its rigid hierarchy, but for Cooper, this is precisely where Christianity comes in. She celebrates this religion's leveling ideals and portrays Jesus as a brilliant feminist who upheld a single standard of purity for both women and men, and who stood against the judgmental tendencies through which men hypocritically place themselves above women. After the fall of Rome, Christianity adapted itself sufficiently to the tastes and prejudices of barbarian culture that the ennobling forces within both traditions could be preserved. This, for Cooper, laid the groundwork for the greatness of Western civilization. So far, this has been a broadly empirical, historical account, but now Cooper shifts to an a priori argument that there must be a close relationship between progress in general and the advancement of women in society. In other words, she sees this as a matter of pure reasoning, which is in no need of empirical evidence. This should presumably not be understood to render her historical account superfluous. Rather, she seeks better to explain the mechanisms of progress that her account sought to capture. Her a priori argument is nevertheless among the more controversial points of the essay and of her thought in general. The position of women determines the progressive and regenerative character of society, not, she says, because woman is better or stronger or wiser than man, but from the nature of the case because it is she who must first form the man by directing the earliest impulses of his character. In other words, the child-rearing role of mothers is what makes women crucial to social progress, or its lack. This has some common sense plausibility, but might be criticized on the grounds that Cooper ties womanhood so closely to motherhood and homemaking 
that she undercuts the feminist ideal of empowering women, the very ideal that she is clearly trying to promote. A similar, though more nuanced impression may be taken from her book's second chapter, entitled The Higher Education of Women. She extols the 19th century as a time of spectacular progress, as witnessed by the numbers of women accessing higher education and thus having greater influence on the ideas and actions of the world. She feels the need, though, to consider the objection that higher learning unfits women for marriage. Cooper is unapologetic in celebrating the way education gives women greater self-reliance and expands their sense of what is possible. But she also relies on Mary Frances Armstrong's argument that education can make women better homemakers than they otherwise would have been. Their knowledge of physiology makes them better mothers and housekeepers. Their knowledge of chemistry makes them better cooks. While from their training in other natural sciences and in mathematics, they obtain an accuracy and fair-mindedness which is of great value to them in dealing with their children or employees. These passages may suggest that Cooper felt unable to challenge the essential domestic duties of women. Not surprising, you might think, since, as we've said, this book came out in 1892. But when we turn to the fourth chapter, The Status of Women in America, we find her discussing the fact that domesticity was far less inevitable in 1892 than it had been in former times. Half a century before the time she is writing, women's activities were far more confined to the kitchen and the nursery. By contrast, in the 1890s, Cooper sees no sphere as completely closed off to women. Not one of the issues of this plodding, toiling, sinning, repenting, falling, aspiring humanity can afford to shut her out or can deny the reality of her influence. No plan for renovating society, no scheme for purifying politics, no reform in church or in state, no moral, social, or economic question, no movement upward or downward in the human plane is lost on her. While Cooper does not disavow the important role of mother and homemaker, highlighted in the first chapter, she here affirms more clearly than ever that women can and should be involved in affairs outside the home on an equal footing with men. Returning to that first chapter, we now arrive at Cooper's transition from discussing the social progress of women in general to the case of black women in particular. Here, she acknowledges the contribution of Alexander Crummel, whom we discussed in episode 53, while also challenging his views. She proclaims woman's influence on social progress to be as obvious as the sun's influence on the world as the source of light and heat, and suggests it is equally unnecessary for her to spend time applying this principle to the question of black social progress. Paraphrasing Ecclesiastes, For is it not written, Cursed is he that cometh after the king? And has not the king already preceded me in the black woman of the south? The king, here is Crummel, the black woman of the south, being the title of an address he delivered in 1883. There is indeed much in that essay that anticipates and thus evidently directly influenced Cooper's essay. For example, Crummel expresses the importance of women to social progress in the following terms. I am anxious for a permanent and uplifting civilization to be engrafted onto the Negro race in this land and this can only be secured through the womanhood of the race. If you want the civilization of a people to reach the very best elements of their being, and then having reached them there to abide, as an indigenous principle, you must imbue the womanhood of that people with all its elements and qualities. To this, Cooper adds what she modestly suggests is a simple amendment, though on closer inspection, it may plausibly be regarded as more of a rebuke, a complaint to the king, disguised as a mere extension of his royal proclamation, if you will. Crummel's essay insisted on distinguishing the racial terms black and colored, saying, In speaking today of the black woman, I must needs make a very clear distinction. The African race in this country is divided into two classes, that is, the colored people and the Negro population. Whereas black and Negro are interchangeable for Crummel, neither has the same meaning as colored, which he uses to refer to those who are of mixed ancestry. The distinction is important, he thinks, because of how differently situated the two groups are, especially with regard to literacy and material prosperity. The much smaller colored group outstrips the much larger black group with respect to both criteria. Crummel thinks the reason is obvious. The colored population received in numerous cases the kindness and generosity of their white kindred, white fathers and relatives. By contrast, the black population, and most importantly for his purposes, the black woman, has been left comparatively uneducated and destitute. 
This is the context for Cooper's remark. I would beg, however, with the doctor's permission, to add my plea for the colored girls of the South, that large, bright, promising, fatally beautiful class that stands shivering like a delicate plantlet before the fury of tempestuous elements, so full of promise and possibilities, yet so sure of destruction. Cooper, herself a colored girl, or rather colored woman in this sense, is not just adding what was left out by Crummel, but rather rejecting his treatment of those in this category as straightforwardly privileged. Against his emphasis on the kindness of white progenitors and kin, she describes the colored girl as often without a father to whom they dare apply the loving term, often without a stronger brother to espouse their cause and defend their honor with his life's blood, in the midst of pitfalls and snares waylaid by the lower classes of white men, with no shelter, no protection nearer than the great blue vault above, which half conceals and half reveals the one caretaker they know so little of. It should be noted that Cooper does not consistently adhere to Crummel's terminological distinction. The very title page of A Voice from the South describes its author as a black woman of the South, not a colored one. And Cooper includes Crummel, who was definitely and proudly on the black side of the distinction, in a list of colored men in the book's sixth chapter. The very fact that black and colored are usually roughly synonymous for Cooper underscores that her point in this passage is indeed to engage critically with the doctor, as she calls him. And Cooper is not done taking on great black thinkers of the recent past. Having expressed her dissatisfaction with Crummel, she next turns her attention to Martin Delaney. As Catherine Sophia Bell has pointed out, Cooper echoes Delaney no less than Crummel with her main thesis. Much earlier than Crummel, Delaney already wrote, no people are ever elevated above the condition of their females. Hence, the condition of the mother determines the condition of the child. To know the position of a people, it is only necessary to know the condition of their females, and despite themselves, they cannot rise above their level. We cannot be certain whether Cooper knew of this passage from Delaney's 1852 book, The Condition, Elevation, Emigration, and Destiny of the Colored People of the United States. Even if she did, this is not why she brings him up. Rather, Delaney is for her the perfect example of a black male leader who regularly presents himself as representative of the race in its entirety. This is the Delaney targeted by the memorable comment attributed to Frederick Douglass, one already mentioned in our episode on Delaney, I thank God for making me a man simply, but Delaney always thanks him for making him a black man. Writing in 1886, so shortly after Delaney's death in 1885, Cooper gives us an example of this tendency on his part while once again bringing up the matter of mixed or unmixed racial identity. The late Martin R. Delaney, who was an unadulterated black man, used to say when honors of state fell upon him that when he entered the Council of Kings, the black race entered with him, meaning, I suppose, that there was no discounting his race identity and attributing his achievements to some admixture of Saxon blood. Cooper shows herself charitable in explaining why Delaney might have been drawn to count himself as an embodiment of his people, yet she thinks it is a sheer confusion to treat any one leader of the race as a representative of that whole race. This is a distraction from the real mechanisms of progress. She argues that a stream cannot rise higher than its source, that a race is but a total of families, and that the atmosphere of homes is no rarer and purer and sweeter than are the mothers in those homes. All of this leads finally to the phrase we promised to quote, the one for which she is now most famous. Only the black woman can say, when and where I enter, in the quiet, undisputed dignity of my womanhood, without violence and without suing or special patronage, then and there the whole Negro race enters with me. As early as 1920, W.E.B. Du Bois quoted this comment in his feminist essay, The Damnation of Women. Much later, in 1984, Paula Giddings titled the book on Black women's activism, When and Where I Enter, The Impact of Black Women on Race and Sex in America. At that time, Cooper was still a little-known figure, but by the second decade of the 21st century, Cooper had become the only woman to be quoted on the pages of the official United States passport. The quotation comes from Chapter 3 of A Voice from the South woman versus the Indian. In context, it is a reflection on the compatibility of the struggles against the oppression of women and against the oppression of Native Americans, 
indeed against all forms of oppression. So if you have a relatively recent U.S. passport, you've carried around these words of Cooper's in your pocket. The cause of freedom is not the cause of a race or a sect, a party or a class. It is the cause of humankind, the very birthright of humanity. This is pretty good evidence that Cooper is now well on her way to being an iconic American thinker, but she has only just begun to receive her due as a philosopher. On this point, it's worth mentioning the final chapter of A Voice from the South, the gain from a belief. It leaves behind the tight focus on matters of gender and race so prominent in the rest of the book and turns to the classic philosophical question of what justifies religious belief. She traces a skeptical position, which for her is a threatening problem, back to Voltaire through David Hume, and then in the 19th century to Auguste Comte. Unlike Antenor Firmin, who, as we saw, was a devoted follower of Comte, Cooper harshly criticizes Comte's positivist philosophy as absurd. She furthermore takes as her chief antagonist in the essay Robert Ingersoll, who was known as the Great Agnostic. Against agnosticism, she champions faith, but not by defending faith within the realm of ideas. Instead, she argues for a close connection between faith and activism, writing, The great, the fundamental need of any nation, any race, is for heroism, devotion, sacrifice. And there cannot be heroism, devotion, or sacrifice in a primarily skeptical spirit. This is no simplistic form of religious fundamentalism. If anything, one might detect here a tendency towards relativism. Whatever belief system can best inspire activism in the name of justice deserves our allegiance. But that may not be the best ism to capture what Cooper is saying. In a brilliant essay focused on this chapter, V. Denise James compares Cooper with the pragmatist philosopher William James and argues that Cooper articulates what we may call a black feminist visionary pragmatism. Religious fervor proves itself not through ironclad arguments, but by what it can accomplish. Speaking of accomplishing things, next time we'll be turning to another female Africana thinker active around the turn of the 20th century, whose practical and political achievements are still celebrated today. She drew attention to the horrifying tragedy of lynching in the United States, and in order to condemn it, had to overcome opposition to the very idea that a woman might speak out on such issues. So join us next time for another important voice from the South, Ida B. Wells, here on The History of Africana Philosophy. I'm gonna tell God all of my